Hi, my name is Kevin Budelman, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I am going to be talking a little bit about customer experience and systems thinking. Share my slides. So just a little bit about me first. Uh, I am president of an organization called People Design, a consulting company based in Michigan. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, different organizations on business design, brand design, and experience design. I'm also president of a, of a global organization called IXDA, which is the Interaction Design Association, uh, which uh, puts conferences together and uh, learning for interaction designers in a lot of segments. I also teach a bit at uh, Northwestern University out of Chicago, and I wrote a book a few years ago called Brand Identity Essentials. So CX and systems thinking. Um, first of all, as we start thinking a little bit about customer experience, I think one of the unique features for designing experiences and creating experiences is that unlike some initiatives that you may participate in, it is uh, fundamentally about time, specifically the customer's time. And uh, that creates some interesting dynamics uh, as it pertains to working in this space. Um, our belief is that you can't actually design, you know, a customer's experience, despite the fact that we think about it this way. We can create, you know, the opportunities to shape an experience. We can create objects and situations and dynamics um, that can affect someone's experience, uh, but we can't, we can't actually change it directly. So the idea of starting to think about systems and plans to shape that experience um, to achieve your aim is what we're interested in talking about today. If we think about time, time is uh, a linear progression. I mean, this is kind of self-evident, but I think it's useful to start framing the work in the context of uh, how, how your customers see it. I mean, the, the kind of the, the classic kind of uh, idea of walking in your customer's shoes um, is useful because it takes you out of your own world and out of your own head and think about it as a as a as a as a, as, as a journey as the customer thinks uh, has, a customer experiences and interacts with you over time in your organization. So if we think about experience as kind of a sequence of interactions, um, it's very useful to think about it as kind of this kind of step by step progression. What happens first? What happens second? What happens third? And if we think about it as a kind of a series of interactions, I've kind of represented them here by these dots, sort of from left to right. You can imagine this is kind of this linear progression of interactions. We like to think about these interactions as opportunities, right? So every, every action, every interaction you have with the customer along the way is an opportunity, and it can be a, meaning it can be a positive or a negative interaction um, based on many criteria. Uh, it can be, and, and it can help either sort of move them forward on their journey, or it may actually have them move back. And so, bringing kind of a level of intentionality as to what what is it that you want to occur at each phase uh, becomes a, a critical part of this. And identifying and trying to map it out is a, is a useful kind of mechanism for planning. Um, we can also think about it, marketers think about it in terms of you know, the idea of a call to action. Um, so we, we sometimes that people design think about it almost as a cyclical process of there's always kind of a uh, call to action and action. For every interaction, there's kind of this, this um, kind of exchange of information or data um, or uh, actions that, uh, that can either, that can help move a customer forward uh, on, their, on, their, on their journey. Another way to think about these series of interactions is almost like we've used the metaphor of uh, almost like Russian nesting dolls, where there's kind of um, almost a nearly infinite number of um, steps that are contained within each step. So if you think about this kind of this customer experience or customer journey as kind of a linear timeline, we can take any one of those experiences or any one of those nodes and kind of blow it out to the next level because that that itself has a number of sub steps and a number of you know parts of it and even one of those could be blown out to uh to to its own sub steps and this may sound like an exaggeration but if you think about the customer experience at the at the highest level you're dealing with you know kind of a sales cycle and customer retention and things of that sort 
but you can zero it all the way down to sort of product level design or all the way down to literally the design of a button and what actually uh, starts to propel a customer forward. Uh, and it's, this starts to get a little fuzzy in terms of the idea of what is customer experience versus user experience. And uh, I know that there are people who probably come from different walks of life and may feel differently about this point of view. This is our perspective at People Design. You know, from, from our perspective, there's kind of a there's kind of a smooth transition here between at, at scale. I think what's important to recognize is at what level of focus are you, uh, or what level are you focused in on in terms of like what is the kind of almost your focal length of a camera. We believe that really the idea of trying to align kind of the biggest things to the smallest things is what makes a more coherent organization and trying to align those things um, is, you know, it, it resonates with even what people like Simon Sinek discuss in terms of the idea of starting with why, what are these kind of macro pictures all the way down to the micro ones? How does it manifest itself on the ground? Something else to keep in mind is while in many of these uh, slides in this presentation, I kind of, you know, depict the customer experience as a, as a linear process, uh, sort of from left to right. I think it's always useful to keep in mind that the, um, ideally, many of these processes are cyclical. Or, and when I say ideally, if you think about a customer experience, you know, and sort of macro level, we might look at it as the idea of the journey from a customer's awareness and what is convincing look like. Uh, this is a selling. What is what is what is the purchase or transaction look like? What does engagement look like? Uh, and what happens after the engagement in terms of customer support or other kinds of um, help? Um, best case scenario, if that's a good experience overall, the customer will go back and do it again. Right? There's kind of a cycle that hopefully improves over time. Um, and so keeping that in mind is um, is useful to think about the fact that while I depict it as a straight line in this case for simplicity's sake, what's actually happening is that it's kind of a cycle. And you can apply the same kind of logic, really. And again, this kind of gets to the micro macro piece that I touched on a moment ago. But what, what is true for a customer experience is also true for a product experience. So you can think about a product experience as starting from kind of your first impression or a setup through the, the initiation, the primary use, the secondary use, and, and so on. So again, it kind of gets into some terminology that people may have different opinions about, but the idea of customer experience and that sort of an, another level down getting to sort of user experience. The other thing I've listed here is if some of you may have uh, heard the idea of these five E's, which is one way to, to define customer experience in sort of five segments anyway. I have it here as almost like a clock, right, where there's 12, uh, 3, 9, uh, 6, and 9. Um, the five E's suggest the idea of enticing and entering, engaging, exit, extend. So it's another way to kind of a framing device to think about how do you uh, d define phases for the customer experience at different parts of their journey. So straightening that line out for again for a minute, just as, a, as an exercise. Um, one thing that we use, one of the lenses that we used as we think about c the customer experience and developing systems is thinking about the performance. So you can think about those uh, kind of a linear path um, from sort of left to right through whether it's micro or macro as either having kind of a positive or a negative kind of uh, feeling. And I think it's useful to recognize that it, behavioral science tells us that people remember negative things uh, many more times more, more significantly than uh, uh, positive experiences. And so it's, it's useful to sort of recognize where those negative and positive experiences along the way um, so that you can plan accordingly. you can start to then use this as a catalyst for, for, to develop research. So many of, the, many of our initiatives in the experience arena start with user research and you can do qualitative research, quantitative research, some combination thereof. But the idea of trying to better understand which parts of the customer experience uh, have been positive and which parts of the customer experience have been negative. So, you know, as you start to identify these phases and these steps along the way, you can start to you can start to put almost a, a little bit of a, a meter on it and say, like, not, not only positive, maybe how positive, or not only just a little bit negative, how, how negative. So quantifying that a little bit as, and visualizing it in such a way that can start to understand, okay, where are, the, where are the areas that are in the red zone and where are the areas that are, uh, that, that are that, where you're performing well? And of course, those areas that have highlight, highlighted here that are kind of in the red 
are things that you might want to address first. I mean, it, it's something that to consider anyway, that these are clearly the problem areas if you start to um, think about it as a, as, a, as a group of interactions or a group of touch points along the customer journey. Having said that, um, it's also useful to recognize that not all touch points or not all interactions are created equally. So sometimes there are business drivers or other research that can start to uh, help you understand that certain interactions might be more important than others. The, one of the great examples that we often think about is the, there's a great one from uh, Tide, uh, the uh, laundry. So uh, the product managers at Tide realized somewhere along the way that, you know, the reality is that most people can't, you know, you can't have a kind of a, a quantitative way of understanding if your clothes are, are more clean. Um, but they, they, they understood through user research that um, the way it's, the way for, that there are two significant touch points, the most significant touch points. The first one actually is the box design, and the second one was the way it smells. So what they really spent a lot of effort doing is, you know, really almost over engineering, over, almost over designing by putting all their energy into, you know, the best box design, which would have, might have the brightest colors, and the most attractive kind of, a, you know, kind of billboard. And then this, this, the second most significant was the way it smelled. So you got, it, you got the box of soap home and you opened it up and suddenly the way it smelled, perceived, you know, it kind of affected your perception of what clean is. And um, it's just an example of, you know, it isn't to say that they didn't also try to make the soap as, as work as well as possible and other kinds of, you know, activities along the way, but they, they recognize that certain interactions were more important than others. So while user research might help you to determine thing that your overall performance um, uh, through the customer experience, um, identifying which of these interactions are actually the most significant um, also might affect uh, where you focus your, your energy and your resources. So another lens to, to think about these, this series of interactions is to think about medium. So, you know, often when we're looking, thinking about a customer experience, it's kind of apples and oranges, right? So what we've indicated here by these different shapes is that, is that there, so some of them are, are uh, let's say, web-based. Some of them might be um, in a physical location or a physical product. Some of them might involve a, a salesperson or uh, some other in, a, a human. Um, one of the ways in which we start to categorize these interactions is by these three lenses, right? So digital, personal, and physical. Um, these, this is kind of, these are kind of broad groupings, but it's partly um, a, a way to think about um, what is the character of the interaction that is deliberately moving it away from uh, departmental definitions uh, or even project definitions, like is this the website or is this you know, the, the, the store. Um, and I'll explain why as we get into this in a few more slides as it relates to departments, but it's useful to think about from, from a medium standpoint because it's, it's helpful to start planning and, and creating uh, asset plans and, and, and uh, kind of experience plans based on that because there's commonality between digital touch points, physical touch points, and, and personal touch points. The way you train, the way you plan, the way you um, start to resource these things. Uh, can be quite different. The other thing that's going on in the background here I, with, in nearly every industry is that there is a lot of, there are a lot of motivations, there's, there's a lot of incentives, I should say, to drive more and more of these interactions uh, to become more digital. So obviously before, even before uh, COVID and this, this current pandemic, which is driving people to more digital and sort of, you know, touchless kinds of interactions, Obviously, there's there's huge opportunity. There can be opportunities for lowering costs by automation, um, or even just providing a higher level of service. If you think about notifications or being able to schedule things online, um, there there's there's more and more of a drive toward transitioning some of these interactions to become digital, and um, that is kind of the stuff of digital transformation that many organizations are are starting to undergo. But this is looking at digital transformation through the lens of customer experience and the opportunities that may reside there uh, as you think through, as you plan out uh, your experience. So digging a little bit deeper, this becomes a little bit of a complicated diagram um, and um, starts to look a little bit like a musical staff, um, but I, I rather enjoy that. Actually, one of the books that are, one of the readings that I use in my class at Northwestern is um, 
a piece by Drucker who talks about um, music as a metaphor for um, more implementing complex systems. So in any case, um, what's actually happening, of course, under the hood, if we think about the different media that are often involved in different steps of the customer experience, is that these, the, they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So while I was just talking a moment ago about digital experiences, many, many times there's a digital experience that's overlapping some other one. So a good example would be chat interfaces on a website where there's a digital interaction, but there's, um, unless you're dealing with a chat bot, there's, a, there's an actual human on the other side, right? So the, you know, the technology in that example can enable different kinds of interactions um, that you might not have had before. Or for that matter, you can think about, you know, the, the role of technology in a physical space um, that is with or without another human. So thinking about, again, what are, the, what are these, again, physical, digital, and personal interactions, and what are kind of the various combinations of which you are going to be delivering on that interaction throughout the customer experience? As I mentioned a moment ago, um, there is a kind of a conventional way to think about ownership of these, uh, these touch points and these interactions. Um, there's kind of an overall flow. Most organizations look at it through the lens of, you know, there's kind of a, there are marketing activities that hopefully lead to sales activities that hopefully lead to customer uh, service and or support activities and different organizations may define these, these silos differently. Uh, but, but clearly there, there is a kind of a departmental view and, and it's often the case that organizations when they're looking to innovate, you know, they have projects and budgets that are, uh, coming from you know funding that is defined by each department. So each of these departments, you know, they may have some um, uh, looking at innovating and being uh, uh, more, more looking to invest to improve their segment of the customer experience. But um, there's a little there's a there can be huge risks there because obviously what's going on here is that there there's kind of a handoff that's going on. So again, if we put our if we put our minds to the look at this through the lens of the customer and the customer journey and their path that they're, they're just taking this progression. They don't know what's happening at your under the hood, so to speak. They don't know which department is responsible for which interaction. All they know is that they're experiencing it linearly. And so there can be such risk at um, uh, losing uh, kind of the sense of continuity and, and um, knowing where the customer is in that progression. Um, there's, there's such a risk of in a sense, navel gazing. If we if we are too focused on innovating within each silo, as, as opposed to looking at the overall customer experience, and it's in part why we call ourselves people design is that we try to focus on kind of the macro problem through the customer's lens. There's another idea here, and this is another kind of complicated music-like diagram, but I think that the it's also useful to recognize that as with me, the medium, the uh, team collaborations are not mutually exclusive either. So there's a concept that exists in custom, the customer experience world that you may be familiar with, the idea of front stage and backstage, right? So if we think about it almost like a theater, there's the front, front stage activity. We think about this customer experience that we are aiming to create for the customer and the steps along the way. We start thinking about the, sort of the backstage activities, right? So the backstage is our, our things that are happening in order to enable that interaction to actually take place the way we want. And those uh, interactions very often overlap or maybe should overlap different departments. So that some, some view like this is perhaps a more useful way to think about uh, what's, how to best service the client. And it very often, so that while there's some level of a handoff conceivably between individual groups within an organization, identifying specifically which of those groups is involved with which of these activities along the way um, is, uh, is, is, a, is a helpful way to start uh, providing some or order to collaboration and using it as a mechanism to create cross-functional teams in order to achieve, um, achieve your goal. Another kind of complexity is to think about audience, of course. One of the things that many of our clients certainly deal with on a regular basis is the fact that they have multiple audiences, um, right? They have uh, multiple either customer types, segments, vertical markets, or for that matter, partners or other kinds of influencers within the market. We are advocates for looking at kind of a broad level customer experience and then working from there to think about what are the variants. 
some segments or audiences may have additional touch points that others don't have. Some may not may actually skip over whole parts of the process based on who they are. Um, you know, you can develop, of course, completely different maps for each type of customer, and sometimes that can be helpful. But the extent to which nearly everybody Google's everything and that they eventually come, you know, they one, at one time or another, they might find their way onto your public website, for example. It's just a good example of how there are, there are ways in which people tend to stumble um, over each other. And so that one touch point might, might actually try, be trying to, um, or that one interaction might have to serve multiple audiences. So being cognizant of the complexity that can come to pass here and knowing which audiences you're, you're really trying to, trying to, to uh, facilitate at, at each interaction is also useful because one of the things that um, some of our clients uh, sometimes get confused with is, is while this can get complicated, it's also true that not every touch point has to, have to, has to address every audience. So some are definitely more important than others. In fact, some touch points actually might be primarily focused on one audience versus another. So getting some kind of level of clarity there can help you develop kind of a more uh, cohesive system. All of this gets pretty uh, complicated or can start to look a little complicated. I've tried to make some simple diagrams to try to, uh, uh, to suggest it. But one of the ways in which we have started to think about this at People Design, in fact, is that you know the, the, it, there's a common um, pattern to think about brand as kind of a uh, subset of marketing. And in the same way that it's easy to think about anything that's technology related is, is, is supposed to come from IT. Um, and so another way to think about the sort of the jurisdiction or influence, if you will, is to think about brand as a more holistic element and think about technology as a more holistic element. So we've kind of developed this little sandwich or hamburger model that <laughs> people design as a way to think about these things. But the way we, the way we think about it is that, you know, brand is um, based, is really a perception that the customer has based on a series of experiences and so the extent to which you can through this kind of planning and system design you can start to think about what um, what perception you're trying to create in the mind of the customer and then what what actions are you taking to create that perception and that all that adds up to the brand so there's there's n none of these interactions along the way are not a brand thing and then technology it's useful to not just kind of pigeonhole technology in terms of like oh it's you know what a certain group of people do Technology enables nearly everything that we are doing today. So obviously, you know, the, the obvious ones would be digital interactions, whether they're websites or apps or screen-based media in a physical environment um, or what have you, or notifications. Um, but the truth is technology is, you know, it comes in all forms. And I think that thinking about technology as an opportunity to enable certain interactions to take place is somewhat more healthy, a healthier way to think about it as something that's spread all along the way. So we've sometimes kind of put brand as kind of this upper level kind of umbrella, and then technology is kind of this foundational pieces piece that can allow you to um, sort of propel things and move forward. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about bathtubs a little bit. No, actually, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cumulative effect of these things. So I've been talking a lot about kind of these, these linear progressions and the makeup, what happens in the, floor, in the, in the um, front stage and in the backstage, and there's questions about medium and timing and scale. Um, but if you start thinking about, like, what does this all add up to? It's, it can be useful to kind of step back a little bit and, and squint your eyes and, and stop looking so much at the individual details and start thinking about, okay, what's actually happening kind of at kind of this macro level? And there is this bathtub metaphor um, that some of you may be familiar with, which I will describe here in a moment. So again, thinking about this kind of the, the, the linear progression, um, we can think about it as there's kind of, you know, ultimately you start in one place and end in another place and you have a kind of goal, right? And you hope that you will achieve something, whether it's you know, over, from a customer experience standpoint, it might be the overall customer experience, it might be some segment or even a product experience or even down more micro than that, as I've mentioned. But ultimately, you can think about, if you think about system design, you can think about it as kind of an input and an output. And 
this is where a bathtub metaphor starts to come into play. So, th so this is um, overtly from a woman named Donel Donella Meadows who wrote a book called Thinking in Systems, another textbook I use in my class. But the idea of system design can be, you know, if you think about it as inputs and outputs and uh, Meadows model has kind of this, this, this idea of something in the middle. Um, and so if you think about these three kind of bathtubs or three buckets of water, let's say, um, you can think about it in this kind of linear progression. And the systems thinking notion is the idea that there are, if you think about there is, you know, things that are coming in, there are things that are going out, and there are things in the middle. And so, and, and I've kind of simplified some of her language here, but she kind of makes a pretty strong argument, but basically every system has kind of these basic dynamics. And the basic dynamics are that if you think about, you know, and again, this kind of, this is why the bathtub metaphor is kind of helpful. If the bathtub is kind of the current state and there's a, cur there's a certain amount of water, let's say in the bathtub, um, you can always add more water in and you can always let more water out. And, there, and, and so the things you, you, can, you can kind of take a look at it and kind of assess at a macro level are the amount of water you have available to put into the bathtub, how much water is currently in the bathtub, and how much water has come out of the bathtub. The other, thing, the other thing you can actually control is if you think about the arrows here as almost like valves uh, or faucets, you can control how much is coming in, how much is going out, and what rate it's coming in and going out. So putting that together, you can start to think about it as a system. And again, this is a, the bathtub is, is kind of a simplified metaphor, but there's, there, there's a lot, uh, there, nearly every system actually can be just, can be sort of defined this way at the sort of the macro levels in terms of inputs and outputs. And those, uh, you know, there are many executives and businesses today that are seeking uh, metrics. So one of the ways in which we've used this model as a way to start thinking about metrics that we can take a look at are starting to measure the volumes and measure the flows, so if you will. So if you think about the, the volume, there's a volume of the inputs, there's a volume of the current state, and there's a volume of the output. And then you can also start to measure the uh, flows. And so here I admit, I sort of indicated as V1, V2, V3, or F1 or F2. Um, starts to look, look a little bit like Scrabble or something, but I think the idea uh, is that there's just a way you can start to look at individual pieces, and that the idea is that if, you, if you're not the idea is that you have certain uh, inputs, whether resources or other types of things, you are trying to propel some kind of an action, and then you're getting some kind of an action on the other side of it. Um, if, the, if the result is not the thing that you're seeking, if you're not getting what you want, um, these are individual levers you can look at, right? So what's, what's coming in at what rate? Um, what's, what is the current state? Um, what's coming out and at what rate? And, are, and those are, if these are levers that you can start to move, these are things that can start to affect, affect the outcome. And at least it's a way to take something that is, that is ultimately a very complex thing, you know, complex, complex systems, and start to put some kind of um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, give you some footing around something that, is, that can be rather complex and abstract. So one way to actually maybe simplify some of that, because that's all, that all gets a little bit complicated, is to think about um, this idea of liminal thinking. So you may have heard uh, that term before. Uh, liminal, actually it's a, in my understanding, is a limit, limit is an actual, it's a, a Latin word that actually has to do with threshold, almost like the door, a, a threshold of, uh, of going into a house or a building. And you may, you know, so it's used in English as part of or the root word. So people think, you know, something like preliminary, right? So. But the idea of liminal, liminality, has a lot to do with where something begins or what's the transition. And you know, so like the transition of going through a door threshold as I'm outside and I'm going through and then I'm into the house or, 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 or in the reverse. Um, it's a really useful way to think about nearly every experience um, as a way to kind of, again, whereas that bathtub stuff gets a little bit complicated and flows in and out. I think another way to think about those three steps is to think about what happens essentially before, during, and after. So I think that nearly every experience you can think about in terms of your, your a macro customer journey, you could think about a, a trip to, the, to a store, you could think about it as a product use, or you could think about it as a, check, a shopping cart checkout process. There's always kind of a, 
before, during, and after element to it. And I think that there, there's a reason for that. And part of that is, I think, the way we think about, again, time, the way, the way you know, we experience things and the way we per, sort of perceive them. Um, there's a lot of interesting literature that's been written on uh, memory and, um, and the way we think about time. In fact, I read a book several years ago by uh, Dan Gilbert called Stumbling, Stumbling on Happiness. And he, and he talked a lot about how we actually are, <laughs> humans are, you know, the, 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 big, the big subtext is also related to about what we do at People Design, which is that people, we are generally not as logical as we think we are. But Gilbert points out in the book how um, we're actually pretty, um, we're not very good at remembering the past. We're not very good at anticipating the future. We're not even very good at, in some ways, self-assessment of where we are right <laughs> at, any, at any given time. But it's useful to think about it in terms of like, as we think about it as a lens before, during, and after, thinking about from the customer's perspective is what do they remember about the past? What are they currently feeling? And what do they anticipate happening in the future? Um, at any given, you know, this is, of course, it's a moving target as they move through this, the kind of the linear progression of your experience. But uh, so much of it is about perception, whether a good experience or bad experience can be influenced by kind of their mental state and what they think is going to happen, what, is, what they remember, what they anticipate, what they, what they think is going to happen. So much of in his point about happiness, the book he, in the book, he talks a lot about happiness essentially is our currently trying to assess what, what is happening in our mind versus what we think should be happening at any given time. So, so much about that is anticipating what it is, what it is that you're thinking of someone that your customer is um, anticipating as a way to sort of meet their needs, which gets, it gets pretty squishy in terms of psychology. So, it, but it's, it's, it's important because ultimately it shapes how they perceive the overall experience, regardless of what of all the mechanics under the hood. Okay, so one of the last ways I'll look about look at this today is to think about storytelling. So many of you may remember either from school days or maybe you use it today, but the idea of storytelling um, is also a very useful way to think about these these sort of linear progressions because while people think about things as an anchor as kind of what happens before, during, and after. They also think about uh, most of what, most of their lives is kind of a story. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty strong argument that we understand nearly everything in our world uh, through, the, through the lens of a story. And there's a, there's a, there's a really interesting, um, I think he's a speaker and author now, but he used to be at PNG named Shane Meeker. And he talks a lot about the, uh, and he was kind of the chief storyteller at P&G with products and so on. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, our compre how we comprehend the world is typically through story. And so customers are, whether you're, you, you are, and you think about this way or not, are creating stories or stories or narratives in their heads about what they're experiencing. So using story architectures like this one, if you're familiar with the idea of exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution. So it's another way to think about almost before, during, and after, right? Like what is, what, where am I in my journey? What is happening to sort of give me the, the clues or the cues to help keep me on track and, make, and sort of help me sort of meet my expectations. So just as a quick summary, um, think about customer experience systems as a sequence of interactions. I think each of those interactions are opportunities. Um, the way we think about it at People Design is that it's so much that, that you can think about it in terms of scale. There are macro interactions and very micro interactions. Um, all of these interactions are a series that can be graphically laid out linearly for planning purposes, but in, in truth are very much of a cycle, or at least one hopes they are if you are returning customers uh, or customers using products or services in more than once. Um, as you think about that planning through the, these inter the series of interactions, um, medium is an opportunity and, and a, a way to think about it, meaning physical, digital, and personal. You can think about it in terms of um, the performance, how well are you performing at each stage along the way, and how might that draw your attention to certain uh, areas of focus? Or for that matter, are there some interactions that are more important than others and to try to focus on those um, as, as another way to focus your energy? Um, thinking about uh, technology and, and, and sort of what's, what's the opportunities that afford themselves there when as we are, um, there's pressure both 
in terms of uh, uh, customer value as well as cost reduction to use technology and, uh, to enhance the experience and enhance the business. Um, audience can play a big role, especially organizations and many, many B2B marketplaces, for example, um, B2C for that matter too, are dealing with you know, complicated marketplaces, um, sometimes uh, uh, multiple types of customers. You know, how, how does that also play into this? Um, as you do so, think about the front stage and the backstage, the backstage team and how that relates to collaboration and how it's not likely that one silo of your organization is, is, is exclusively dealing with uh, one series of touch points. It's typically kind of some overlap requiring them to work together. Um, we like to think about, again, kind of the uh, brand technology sandwich, if you will, or hamburger um, as a way to think about branding and technology as it relates to customer experience. Um, and then stepping back kind of more holistically about what are the inputs and outputs? What are the flow of these things? What metrics can you find along the way? Um, and that to, by, at, at the sort of the most fundamental level, think about each experience as kind of a, a series of what happens before, during, and after. And how does that add up to kind of a story or a narrative in the mind of the customer? So that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, feel free to email me. And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. Bye.